Hello, Kingdom Men. Ned Winters here again with our session number 14. Keep sending me your questions and comments, and I hope everybody had a challenging week. Remember, men, there's no maintaining. Let's strive to get better each and every day. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the certainty of your kingdom. Help me to show my gratitude to you by serving you faithfully each and every day. Give me the grace I need to make the most of the time, talents, and treasures you have loaned to me. Help me to use them to prioritize your agenda over mine, Lord Jesus. Help me live out 1 Corinthians 15 and 58. Make me steadfast and movable, always abounding in your work, O oh Lord, knowing that my toil is not in vain in the Lord. Transform me, Lord, into a kingdom man. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Last week we discussed chapter number 12, a kingdom man and his personal life. That was an extremely challenging lesson. Men, it's time we truly fear God, letting that show in our actions by always placing Christ first in our time, our talents, and our treasures. Last week we looked at Psalms 128. Psalms 128 is the benchmark scripture for a kingdom man. Today, we'll continue our journey in, in, through Psalms 128. We will be discussing chapter number 13, A Kingdom Man in His Family Life. Now, after writing about a man's personal life in Psalms 128, David moved to a man's family life. Psalms 128, 3 and 4 states, Your wife shall be like a fruitful vine within your house, your children like olive plants around your table. Behold, for thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. A man's decision to marry a woman and begin a family is one of the most important decisions he will ever make. Marriage should only happen after much thought and prayer. Marriage is no small thing, men. Marriage should only happen when both parties fully comprehend the meaning and purpose of marriage. When a man is a successful husband and father, he not only brings a blessing to, into his life, but he also helps his family to fulfill their destinies. As Psalms 128 moves from the individual to the family, this represents the divine order of creation. As we learned earlier in Kingdom Men, God created Adam first. God gave Adam the responsibility of personal dominion, and he gave him guidelines. God gave Adam this before he ever created Eve. Adam had to first learn his individual dominion. Adam had to first learn his individual authority. Adam had to learn God's kingdom of gender, and Adam had to do all this before ever having a family. Most if not all, problems in our culture today can be traced back to the breakdown of the family. If a man functions according to God's kingdom principles, then if the family functions according to God's kingdom principles, when the individuals within the family are functioning according to God's kingdom principles, then it only makes sense that both the church and society will function accordingly. The creation of humankind was so that man could be an image bearer of God. Genesis 128 reads, God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. When God commanded Adam to be fruitful and multiply, it was just not to fill the earth with people, but it was also to fill the earth with image bearers. The goal of the family then is to replicate the image of God, not just to simply form a happy, a happy place called home. The purpose of children is not just to have lookalikes, but to produce children who reflect the image of God and operate according to God's kingdom agenda. By establishing the institution of the family, God has expanded his kingdom agenda here on earth. 
And as you may have guessed, this is precisely why Satan is trying to destroy the family. If Satan can destroy the family, he can stop God's kingdom agenda. Whoever owns the family owns the future. Satan is attempting to warp our view of manhood. And by doing that, Satan is attempting to redefine the family and stop God's kingdom agenda. In redefining the family, Satan is attempting to set up a rival kingdom, a rival kingdom that undermines God's purpose for the home. Satan is trying to kill our future, just like he tried to kill all the male children when Jesus was born. By trying to get rid of the men when they were boys, trying to kill Jesus, Satan attempted to kill the future, kill our future. Men, your role is critical, and Satan's primary goal is to keep you from performing it. He's trying to keep you from performing the role as a kingdom man and living according to God's kingdom principles. The first kingdom principle for marriage, which is the foundation of the family, is that marriage is to be viewed and treated as a covenant and not simply as a contract. Too often, we adopt cultural view of marriage and it becomes simply a means for love and happiness. These things are important, are an important part of marriage, but they are not the most important things in a marriage. Marriage is a covenantal union designed by God. It is designed to increase the capacity of both partners. It is designed to increase their capacities to carry out their divine purpose for advancing God's kingdom. In Malachi, we read about this covenant. Malachi 2, 13 through 14. This is another thing you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with your tears, with weeping and with groaning, because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. Yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth, against whom you have dealt treacherously, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Men, a covenant is more than some form of contractual agreement. In Scripture, a divinely authored covenant is a spiritual binding relationship made between God and his people. And it includes certain agreements, benefits, conditions, and outcomes. Some examples are the covenants God made with Abraham, covenant between God and Moses, the covenant between God and David, and the new covenant made through Jesus Christ. Marriage is also a covenant. When a marriage functions according to the rule of the covenant, blessings of the covenant are a result. And as you may have guessed, when a marriage functions outside the rules of a covenant, there are some negative consequences as a result. When men approach marriage as a covenant with fear and reverence of God, Scripture says that his wife will be like a fruitful vine. Who knows anything about grapes? Who, who has actually seen great vines? And as you may or may not know, a vine must do three important things to be fruitful. Number one, a vine must clean. Usually a vine is elevated and tied to a post. It must cling to the post so that it will not drag on the ground. If a vine drags on the ground, then it won't absorb the needed sunlight to grow. So... For a vine to produce fruit, it must first cling. It must be securely fastened and tied to the post. Man, the same is true for your wife. For your wife to be the kingdom woman she was created to be, you must first provide a place of security, a place that is strong and stable, a place where she will not just want to, but be able to cling to you. By allowing and encouraging her to cling to you, you will keep her from clinging to something or someone else. 
something or someone else that may not encourage her personal growth and development. Number two, a vine must climb. The second thing a vine must do to produce fruit is climb. A fruitful vine climbs all over whatever it is clinging to. When a, vine is free, when a vine is free to climb, it is able to expand the ability to receive nourishment, and it will grow. What many men do, however, because of their own insecurities or their fears, is stop their wives from developing the skills and the gifts God has uniquely given to her. Rather than wives who feel free to climb, many men end up with wives who are frustrated and or feeling controlled. A frustrated or controlled vine will not produce any fruit. But when a vine is able to both cling and to climb, it will, it will then do the third thing required to produce fruit. It will cluster. When a vine cluster, it produces fruit that is then able to produce wine. Men, when you operate as a kingdom man, scriptures tells us that your wife will cling, climb, and cluster. This will allow her to produce fruit, and this fruit would not just be beneficial to her and to you, but it also would be beneficial to others within your influence. But keep in mind, the verse specifically says, your wife shall be like a fruitful vine. The verse does not say she is a fruitful vine. This is because the ordained, the ordained order starts with you men in the home. Your wife becomes what you name her. If you choose not to name her, this opens the door for Satan to take your place. But if you choose to name her a kingdom woman, she shall be a fruitful vine. Now, being a kingdom husband is a big responsibility. Paul's us tell, Paul tells us it's a threefold responsibility. The first responsibility is being your wife's savior. Ephesians 5 and 25 says, Husbands, Love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. First, a husband should be his wife's savior. He is to love his wife like Christ loved the church. Christ loved the church to death. You are to be her savior in the sense that you are, you are to sacrifice your life for her well-being. Sacrificing your life for her well-being is truly living out what Paul encourages when he says that husbands are to love their wives the way Christ loves the church. In order to discover how a man is to love his wife, let's look at how Christ loves the church. How did Christ love the church? First, he gave himself up for her. Ephesians 5 and 25. This refers to a sacrifice. Jesus' sacrifice tells husbands what it means to love. We love by choice, not by feeling. Loving your wife today has nothing to do whether, whether or not you feel like it. Biblical love focuses on the need of the person. It does not necessarily focus on the emotions or the wants. It is righteously and passionately pursuing the well-being of the other, even if it comes at a personal cost or sacrifice. I know it's tough. I do. Life, culture, life and culture has always taught us to look out for numero uno, look out for number one, take care of number one. Now, as along with being your wife's savior, a husband is to sanctify his wife. Ephesians 5 and 26. So, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. Men, to sanctify something means to set it apart as unique and special. 
A man sanctifies his wife over time through discipleship and in providing a place where she is safe to grow and to develop. Man, when you married your wife, you, you didn't just marry her, but you married her history. Man, you married all the things that she didn't tell you, all the things that form the way she approaches life, all the things that form the way she perceives life and the things around her. You also married all of her struggles and self-doubts. Too often, and I know, as men, we get caught up in our own struggles and all, our own self-doubts, and we never stop and take the time to notice our wife's struggle, her battles, her fights each and every day. Sanctification, men, is a process of taking someone from where they are to where they ought to be. If your wife has never known security, if your wife has never known a man to provide a stable place for her, your wife may be a little hesitant to submit to you as her husband. But through sanctification, you have the opportunity to demonstrate to your wife exactly what it means to be covered by a kingdom man. Not a perfect man, but a kingdom man who has her best interests at heart in a kingdom man who loves her even to the point of sacrificing, sacrificing his own needs and wants to provide for hers. Lastly, a kingdom man satisfies his wife. Paul writes Ephesians 5, 28 through 29, so husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. Who He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church. Whatever you do for yourself, man, you ought to do for her. Man, if you treat her like you treat your own body, man, when you are, when you are with her, you are to think in terms of two and never just in terms of one. It is in your own best interest and hers to satisfy your wife emotionally, spiritually, and physically. Man, you don't have to be a biblical scholar as a spiritual head of your home. You do, however, however, have to be intentional. Intentional about leading her in spiritual growth. The first step in learning how to satisfy your wife, man, is understanding your wife. Study her. Get to know her. Find out what makes her ticks, her tick, what motivates her, what inspires her. Discover what her dreams are and how they connect with your own. So many men neglect the greatest gift in life, their wife. And unfortunately, this is to their own detriment. Scripture even tells us if we do not live as kingdom men, as kingdom husbands, even our prayers will be hindered. First Peter 3 and 7 reads, Your husbands and you husbands in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way, as with someone weaker, since she is a woman, and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life, so that your prayers will not be hindered. A wife who is given the environment to flourish will first flourish within the home, but we also see in Proverbs 31, she will also flourish outside of the home. Proverbs 31 tells us, she is a businesswoman negotiating with merchants from afar. She has a real estate license because she is buying and selling property. She has her own ministry looking after the poor. And to top it off, she takes care of herself, making sure she looks good and dresses in purple in the couture gar garments of the day. Her children are not lacking. Her husband is praised in the gates. Why? Because everything she does outside of the home complements the priorities of the home. One thing you can do, men, to give your wives the best environment to flourish is to be intentional about complimenting her. Let her know on a daily basis that she's valued and tell her why. Tell her what you love about her. Tell her what is special about her. Tell her what you enjoy and appreciate about her. 
Beyond that, men, pray often for and with your wife. Pray about what is on her mind, but also pray with her. Let her hear you praying for her every day. Give her the added security of knowing that you are seeking God on her behalf and that you are seeking God on behalf of your union in marriage. Men, when you fear the Lord and walk in his ways, when your wife is a fruitful vine in your home, your children will be like olive plants around your table. Psalms 128 and 3. The interesting thing about an olive plant is if it's cared for properly, correctly, it will become an olive tree. A tree, it's amazing, a tree can produce olives for over 2,000 years. As a kingdom man, one of the greatest things you can offer your children is modeling yourself as an olive tree with deep roots of stability. Our problem today is not merely a lost generation, but it is the product of a lost generation. We have fathers who have never seen their fathers be a kingdom man, be a kingdom husband, or be a kingdom dad. So we have children raising themselves. So we have children looking to the government to raise them. So we have tables with no olive plants around them. Our tables are empty. The way God designed it, a family is to be led mainly by a father around the table. A Jewish father raised his family around the table. The table was not just a place for eating. It was a place for nurturing. Food was simply the context for discipleship and relationship building. When a Jewish father sat around the table, he wasn't just filling his stomach. He was gathering his family there to lead them. It was there that he led them in devotions. It was there that he heard of any potential behavior problems. It was there that responsibilities were given and checked whether or not these duties had been completed. It was there that the family discussed emotional issues and there the family made strategies for achieving goals. It was around the table that a father learned what peer groups his children were associating with and what information those peer groups were filling the minds of his children with. It was there that he poured out value and significance into the lives of his children by listening to them and being with them on a consistent basis. A Jewish father didn't sit at the table just to eat. Rather, this was a place for a man to spend time every day teaching, listening, knowing, and leading his family. There were other times that this would occur, but those were in addition to being around the table. Fruitful vines and olive plants need consistent care to produce and to grow. Unfortunately, men, so many of our tables are empty today because of men's schedules are full, women's schedules are full, children's schedules are full. We have failed to prioritize the consistency of the family table. We have failed in a daily family time wherever we may choose to spend it, around the table, in the den, on a, on a walk, wherever. And by doing so, men, we have failed to lead our families well. And as a result, we have a generation of young people who care more about the culture than what was given to them around or at the table. Men, do not neglect the table. Whether it's breakfast, lunch, dinner, or all of the above, the table is designed not merely for food. It is designed for a connection to take place. It is designed for you to intentionally and consistently engage. Engage with those you are destined to care for and those you must lead well. Calling all kingdom men. Men, we have to go beyond the table. 
Men, it is important that you intentionally, on purpose, make yourself a consistent part of the family. So many men simply pop in on special occasions. So many men consume themselves with work or with hobbies or hanging out with the fellas or taking some deserved me time. Men, this leaves your wife and children with empty hearts. Nothing can fill the role made from the ab- fill the hole made from the absence of a husband and or father. Even the best mother in the world can't meet the need children have for the approval and the attention of their father. As you know, As you've been told time and time again, and it's true, the time you spend together doesn't have to be fancy. The time you spend together doesn't have to be formal. Men, just make it a priority to be with your family. Men, the time you spend with your family should never be a second thought. It should always be your first thought. Put first things First, if you haven't done it in the past, it's never too late to start. Start today. If your kids have moved out, go visit them. Invite them over. Call them up. Pick up the phone when they call you. I'm guilty of that. Family must come first after God. This is how God designed our lives to function. And when we function according to God's kingdom agenda, not only will we be blessed, but those within our care will find themselves fruitful and blessed as well. They will become what they were destined to be. In biblical culture, men, men did not have to be prodded. Men did not have to be encouraged to spend time with their families or children. Men knew it was their responsibility. It was their duty to pass on the covenantal rights and responsibilities to the next generation. In fact, men were both the dominant presence and men were the dominant influence among all family members. However, today this role has flipped. There are a large number of women in influential positions throughout the development of the lives of our children. Most boys spend the largest part of their lives with women, first in their mother's womb. Next, the babysitters are usually female, as are the nursery workers. And even most K through 12 schools and Sunday school teachers are usually females. Now, don't misunderstand me. We truly praise God for the role that females play in our culture and in our church. However, what is often missing in the development of a kingdom man or kingdom men is a strong, consistent male presence. When you have an increase in males missing in action, there is an overarching weakening of the manhood felt throughout all society. And because of this, we are at a great risk, at a great risk of raising boys who will grow up to be men just like their mothers. Men, never underestimate your role as a father. It's never too late. Start now. Remember, men, fathers, husbands, Dads, that your children's view of God will largely be dependent on their view of you. Wow. That was a tough one, man. Next week, we'll, we'll cover chapter number 14, A Kingdom Man in His Church. I know these last couple of chapters have been tough and they've been challenging to us all. But hang in there, man. This will only strengthen us as we continue our journey to become kingdom men. Again, have any questions, comments, feel free to text me or email email me. Let's pray. 
Lord, you are first in my time, my talents, and my treasures. Help me to make your kingdom agenda my agenda. And help me to make an eternal difference for you by being the kingdom man you created me to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a good week.